Welcome to Lift Your Legacy. My name is Jacob Rupp, father, husband, and rabbi. And each week we bring you an inspiring person or message to help you unlock your inner potential and create change that will impact the future. Thank you for listening and let's get to it. Back, ladies and gentlemen, this is Jacob Rupp with Lift Your Legacy. I am thrilled today to have on the master of communication. Now, it's so important to be able to effectively communicate, to stand up in front of people. It's interesting, people say, you know, famously that uh, people fear public speaking more than death. And here's a guy that helps you learn how to swim with the sharks. Uh, Elazar Blatt is, he's got like, he's got, he's really a jack of all trades. He's got a really crazy story in show business. Um, in the in the entertainment scene in Los Angeles and New York throughout the throughout the country, and then um, really working under one of the great uh, inspirational leaders of the 20th century, 21st century, Rav Noach Weinberg. He was his, uh, worked with him personally, and I don't know you want to call him a personal assistant or whatever it might be, but he was like really in the trenches with Rav Noach. Um, so we go through a lot today. This is really one of those interviews. It's like kind of point part one of two or five. Uh, but we, we delve into the importance of communication, how to tell your story, how to craft your story, why that's important, and also just a general overview of how someone could kind of take their fascinations and their interests in their life and be able to sort of meld it into a career. So with no further ado, Elazar Blatch. Ladies and gentlemen, as always, Lift Your Legacy is committed to helping you live a more authentic and meaningful life. That being said, if I could ask you to share this podcast with someone that you think would get value from the message, that would be fantastic. In addition, I wanted to make you aware that along with the podcast, I do offer executive coaching. I help people who are successful and highly motivated, who want to see extreme, or not even so extreme, maybe just a small change that in their life. I want to help them get to the next level. What does that mean specifically? Creating more peace in your relationships with yourself, growing your business, clarifying your career, and even if you need a little bit of help losing some weight or getting more healthy, I do that also. I'm not for everyone, but for those people that are invested in making their life better and taking the next step, I highly recommend you consider me as a coach for you. Now, how do you get in touch? Well, you found the podcast. I wanted to tell you also my email, Jacob, my first name, Jacob at Lift your legacy dot live feel free please to reach out there or on all any or all of my social media channels i'd be thrilled to give you a complimentary half an hour conversation to see if we might be a good fit to work together and now with no further ado i ask you to please sit back and enjoy the show Rabbi Eliezer Blatt, thank you so much for joining me today. I am thrilled to have you on. You are the master, the international speaker trainer. I feel like I have to be on the top of my game. I've never actually spoken to a, a professional speaker trainer before. I hope this isn't terrible, so I appreciate so much you being here and you are coming across in such a non-judgmental way. Also, what's amazing is that you really represent the old guard of, of Ashatar, having worked very closely with uh, Rav Noach Weinberg, an organization and a person I am greatly enamored of and, and, and honored now to be a part of it. And you've really seen, besides you're like a drummer, you've done all kinds of like, like awesome stuff. You live multiple exciting lives. So I'm really excited to, uh, to jump in with some of the practical skills today. Thanks for joining me. Uh, thanks for having me. My pleasure. So, Get, get me to where you are today. I know it's a long story, but how did you wind up being uh, orthodox? How did you wind up getting into Asia Torah? And then how did you really develop into the speaker trainer? Yeah, like, like many of your guests, uh, I have, I'm one of those, uh, those stories that uh, Baal Shuva, yeah, at a young age, I was, it was pre-ADD. I mean, they had ADD, but they didn't call it that. I was the dreamer. And my teachers were smart enough to pull me out and make me the singer, dancer, actor of my grade school. So I'd get up there and I would do all the plays and the leads uh, in front of my, my, so I was in front of people and I was loving it until I was 10. When I was 10, I decided I wanted to become a drummer. I figured 
drums for a little guy. You know, I was the first kid in class, you know, red right. hair, blue eyes, freckles. You know, we're not going to talk about the hair. Yeah. And uh, I started playing the drums. I got into a rock and roll band. And we were pretty good. In fact, did, we won- did you have a favorite drummer or someone that like inspired you to get started? You know what? There was a kid in sixth grade. There was a kid in elementary school. People don't ask me that question so much. And he got up there on stage and started playing the drums. Just him on stage. I even remember the song. It was called Wild Horses. <laughs> Rolling, Rolling Stones? I don't know. It was just, it was just music. Okay. It was just music, but he but it created space for him to do a to solo. And for a little kid, and I was watching this, and I'm like, wow. Here I thought singing, dancing, and acting. That was the way to get, to get out there. And I see these, these drums, so I, I started playing. And uh, I remember at my, uh, my sister's bat mitzvah, uh, when the band took a break and everyone went down to eat, I asked the drummer, could I stay up and, and play your drums? And uh, he said, great, I must have been about eight eight years old, and I sat down on his drums, and I could still remember, I was like in another world, no one was in the room, and I was just playing, and that was the beginning of my, uh, my, uh, my drumming. So I got into this rock and roll band, and we won this battle of the bands, and it was great. It was two hours recording time in a major studio, and we went in, and we recorded some original tunes, and a producer of a, of a hit rock group yeah, <laughs> heard us, and he said, I want you to be the opening act for my my group, I want to take you around the country. And we were like blown away, you know, we were, you know, high schoolers. So I said, uh, you know, great. And then the singer of my band had a nervous breakdown and that was it. We were just the, uh, we were just his band. And so I didn't know what to do with myself. I'm in, I'm in uh, finishing high school. So everyone said, you have to go to college. Wait, wait, where are you living at this point? I'm in Brooklyn for all this point. I'm living in, in, in Brooklyn, yeah, growing up and and now I have to go to college. So I go to college. What am I going to learn? So I learned television production. I figured television, little theater, music, dance. I get my degree and uh, I'm ready to go off. And then the number one situation comedy yeah. pulls right into Brooklyn Studios. So I go in there. I say, I'm just out of college. I'm just out of school. Give me a try. Oh, before that, I did some things also. I had a great MTV. I'm just thinking, I haven't thought about this for a while. This is good doing this now is bringing me back uh mtv in the in the 1980 we're talking 83 we're talking hot years what was my job yeah now remember i'm coming in i'm, I'm an intern i'm working with the producer over the mtv here's my job i need to greet the guests when they come and take them to lunch guess who i'm going to lunch with who? every day who? madonna elton john you're kidding Super tramp just, just the two of you? Just the two of us walking around the corner. It was, it was West Side Manhattan in the middle of nowhere. So no one knew these stars were there in a place no one knew. The guy at the restaurant, he knew, you know, this is what I do. And he, he doesn't say anything. <laughs> you know, he, he can't use the phone while I'm there. You know, it was pre-cell phone. Wow. Wait, so what was that? I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's a whole thing into himself. What? Lunch with the stars. I haven't thought about this for a while. What, what was, did you, did you learn lessons? Were you inspired? Were you starstruck? What was it like? Uh, uh, the starstruck, well, first of all, I was a musician. So there's a connection there. As far as starstruck, it's interesting. After a while, you get, it becomes your job. They're just people. At first it's like, Ellen John, <laughs> super tramp. But then it's, what happened was I, uh, it started to be like, it was like person to person. They didn't, they didn't need someone over there with starstruck. So like when I'm having lunch with Brian Adams and I say, come on, you know, I'm like interviewing him. Like, you know, you're interviewing your people saying, you know, best man in rock and roll. Yeah. And he's like, you know, give me a break. He was so cool. He was so, so real. So some of the people were <laughs> off the wall, but uh, the drummer of Supertramp, uh, his name is uh, Bob C. Benberg. Yeah. That's his stage name. I'm talking to him. He's a Jewish guy. Bob C. Benberg. <laughs> sounds like it. So we, we have, we have a, the Jewish connection. Now I had had no, and we're going to get to like the, the Jewish part of the story. I have not had really no connection. I just happened to be Jewish. He happened to be Jewish. So we're, now we're two Jews talking, not, uh, not two rock stars. You, it, you know, I just, I wanted to point out something that, that, that pops into my mind. It's really interesting because 
the the concept of celebrity has so shifted. I think, first of all, you know, you see the, the rise of television and then obviously the way that the music industry really turned musicians into the celebrity c- culture. But finding the fact that underneath everything, they're people and being able to relate to them as, as a person is kind of a unique super talent. Now, the interesting thing is nowadays with Instagram and with social media, it's almost like everyone has the potential if you have the big en- a big enough following to achieve this super, you know, superhuman status. So it's like, we almost don't know how to interact with anybody. I had a, a relationship, it was a relationship. I, I listened to one rabbi on, uh, on tar- tour anytime for about three years. And I, I loved him, I knew everything he said. And he came to LA and I went and, and I met him. And it was it was exactly the same thing. It's like I was totally starstruck, but there was like nothing to nothing to talk about. You know what I'm saying? So it's like I wasted that opportunity. So having that awareness that no matter how big a person is or how big their following is, you're not going to get anything if you treat them like a, like a celebrity. You're only going to get something if you're able to like actually connect with them based on the Jewish thing or, or who you are. Mm-hmm. Right. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. That was good. And it was different. Some stars, like I said, were. Were, were stars always. Some guys like Brian Adams, some of the, the musicians I met were just were, were real were real people. Not saying that the stars were, they just, they, they were, their heads were in a different, uh, a different mindset. But yeah, so that was experience. So I had, I had the, working with MTV, top team. Um, when I'm looking back on it, I happened to, I was able to work with some of the best of the best in that field. The MTV was top at the time in, in cable. The situation comedy show I was working was the number one show, you know, and I, I walked into that show and after a week, they hired me as a writer's assistant. What a great entry level position. So I'm working with the best writers in television. We're sitting in a room and what was my job over there? Remember, I'm, this is entry level. So I'm sitting there, they're doing the show. They're on the phone with the, uh, with the host who's doing his, uh, his show somewhere else. And we'd, we're working on scenes and they would turn around at certain scenes and they'd say, Larry, you know, my English name, you know, what do, what do you think? You know, so I would, I would throw out my idea. Next thing I know, they use it on the show. And I remember being on the show when we're shooting it, the director, Jay Sandridge, who's one of the biggest uh, television directors, he did the uh, um, uh, Goldie Horns, Seems Like Old Times. I think he did the Mary Tyler Moore show. He was the assistant director of the I Love Lucy show. Now, wow. I don't know what, that's to, awesome. what that means to many of your viewers. <laughs> but to a TV person, you know, you touch those shows. So he turns around to me and he says, he says, Larry, how do you feel? 25 million people are laughing at your joke. Wow. So that was like, that was wow. when I first, uh, first thought it. So I was doing that, working for shows. After that, I started working for Coca-Cola commercials. Um, I started working. And then I got landed my greatest job. It was with a show called Reading Rainbow. Top children's show, LeVar Burton. Everyone remembers they start singing the song. <laughs> were you were you aware like how, how is it as a young as a young man that was touching so many like big like big projects and big opportunities? Did you feel like your your life was on this crazy upward trajectory? I was. This is what I wanted to do. I had a friend. Uh, he was planning to be a neurologist. We were having a race. Who can make the most money in the short amount of time. That was our race. So when I'm doing this, we're, we're rocking, you know, we're, we're moving. When the, when the band fell, I was like, oh man, I lost some ground. I knew it was gonna take about 10 years. <laughs> okay. He was on his trajectory for 10 years, yeah. So uh, he's a very big neurologist now. <laughs> so somewhere. So hopefully, I'm, hopefully you're waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, uh, that's okay. Now. So now, now, at what point do you find Judaism? What time do you? At what point do you find Asia Torah? What, what What was it like in your life at that point? Were you looking for something? No, I wasn't looking. I was I was doing it at the, at the point. I was being groomed at this point um, to make television shows. Yeah, I had a few different people waiting um, because once you're on a show and you're on a team, they know you. So you go through different phases, but the, the, the teams like to, pe- winners want to be with the winners. They just stay together. That's how that business works. So I was being groomed to do that. 
uh, and going from show to show and do different how things. do you how do you groom I, I think that's a fascinating concept about winners wanting to hang with winners and I think so much of the, there's a certain frustration that a lot of people encounter of well I don't know how to get started but but I think what you said is you know, once you see, it's not like you have to have the network. You just have to know one guy that knows the network or, you know, so how, how do you cultivate that mindset of becoming a winner that winners want to hang out with? I think uh, in my case, you know, I was the young guy. I was just out of school. I was hungry for it. I was into it. Uh, if you get along with people, I mean, I'm thinking back now, you connect, especially in that business. I'll give you an example in the television show. When I, was, uh, when I came to interview for Reading Rainbow. You know, I came, they asked me to come onto the set and work with them for a day. Yeah. And the next day they, they hired me. And I remember the producer saying, you know, we interviewed close to 50 people for this position. And she said, but you, you fit in with us. You're able to fit in. Yeah, I mean, that particular show, it probably had, it was, uh, it was a crew probably about 15 women. Only the boss was a man. I think my, my experience growing up with three sisters at home helped with that. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing because I think a lot of people would look at an opportunity like this and, and have the inclination to go in and really try to, quote, shine and like kind of throw themselves out there with the hope that what they are is what the, what the organization is looking for. But the reality is it sounds to me like you're saying that, no, people – with a strong culture, a successful company, a successful venture, they sort of know who they are and they want to hire a team player that can sort of adopt to and then bring their own, you know, uh, a challenge, uh, not challenges, strengths and, and abilities to, to the program. So that, that's, a, that's a big mindset shift. Exactly, exactly. I think that's what, yeah. And so I was a, I was a happy guy, you know, I came in and they saw that and I was able to, you know, fit in. And I think this, this was the beginning of me being able to communicate with people, learning. I was learning from the best, the best directors, producers. Um, how do you, how do you, you know, communicate your talent on the show to the world? That's what I was watching. So I was with the, you know, for the, co for the show that I was working on, you know, Cosby show, this uh, Jay Sanders who was doing it, it was, he was an Emmy Award director. These were Emmy Award director uh, 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 level for the shows I was working on, whether MTV for cable, or reading Rainbow, the shows I was working for was all was all top. So I was surrounded by people I was able to model and uh, to learn from. So that was that stage. And then this, uh, there was a switch that came. Someone uh, someone invited me to a class at Asia Torah. They said, "If you you know you got to come to this." Well, first it started off come to a Purim party, a Hanukkah party. They were slowly getting me into things, and it was nice. Jewish people. Um, lively conversations, guys and gals. Uh, it, for, for me, it was fun because I was I was doing well in the in the profession, so that was like a, a nice social thing. But I didn't have I went to Hebrew school, but I didn't have any uh, connection. And once I graduated Hebrew school, you know that was pretty pretty much it. Did you find that the people at that original event um, were like your type of people? I mean, here you are sort of, you know, in this world of, of the most successful in the, in, in the um, entertainment industry, did you feel like these are my folks when you, when you showed up at the, at the events? It was uh, young professionals. Okay. In Manhattan, Upper West Side. So these were, these were, they were all players. Right. Yeah. Well, I just, I, you know, just, I'm putting on my nonprofit hat for a second and, I, and I'm, I'm uh, wanting to call attention to just how important that is, which is that, you know, you have to sort of figure out the kind of people you want to attract and then put together that, that group of people. And even I see, in, I see in San Diego, it's like young professionals don't mean the same thing. You know, you kind of really have to figure out, okay, well, what's my, what's my type of young professionals I want to work with? Yeah. Otherwise you would have left. If you walked around, you're like, these are not my people. You would have, you would have never found this. Yeah, so these these were yeah these were like my people, and I was over there, and I was learning, and I became the rabbi of my work. Yeah. Right. I, I was enjoying the learning so much. I go back into my work at this time. I was working for another company. I was, um, I was learning how to be a professional video editor at this point because my boss at Reading Rainbow he said, you know, I'm paying a video editor big bucks to edit my shows. Why don't I show you how to do that? You know, you have to learn how to do that. At the time, at that time, video editing was a big thing. Today. Pre my, uh, my eight-year-old can do on the computer what we used to do on the world's most sophisticated equipment. Um, 
So I was going to learn that. So that I figured the editing and the making shows together would make me more marketable. So I had to go now and learn from a place. That was going to be a two-year process to learn how to be an online editor at the time. Today, it's all different. It's all digital. But at that time, it was big machines and all. At that time, you know, I feel like an old man, you know. So uh, I was doing that. And uh, right at that time, that's when I was, I was uh, uh, going to these classes. So one of the rabbis, he said, if you like learning here once a week, you should go to Israel. We have a three-week program yeah, in Israel, Aisha Torah. So I said, wow, you know, maybe I'll, be, I'll go to Israel for three weeks. I'll become a real rabbi. That's what I'm thinking because I'm learning. So I asked my boss for, uh, for three weeks, my vacation off, because I didn't want to go to Israel anything less. And he was wondering why I wanted to take three weeks in a row, because no one takes three weeks off, off in a row. He says, I'm too busy. You can't go. So I didn't know what I was going to do. I was going, leaving on Friday, going to my rabbi's house. It was one of those early, early Shabbats where you have to leave early to go. You have to leave at 1 o'clock to go home, shower, and shave. And uh, I'm leaving. And my boss is coming. He says, Black, I need you to work overtime tonight. And I said, I can't, boss. Jewish boss, but I wasn't ready for, uh, for the story. Sunday rolls around, and my coworker says, the boss wants to see you. What do you think is going through my mind? You're fired. I'm fired. I'm like, great. If he fires me, I'm there two years. I'm ready to be my other boss's editor. I collect unemployment. I'm off to Israel. <laughs> great. I call him up. He says, I'm too busy. Now, usually, if the boss is going to fire the employee, he, the employee doesn't call him up to remind him. <laughs> he's <laughs> oh, he's, he's too busy. Friday comes. I got to leave early again, early Shabbos. Boys, you want to see me? Get up here. I walk up to his office. He's pacing back and forth. He says, you're probably wondering why I didn't offer you any overtime this week, Black, because overtime is everything in the business. So he didn't offer me any of that. Big. So I'm like, great, he's going to fire me. He says, but I like you, kid. And then I realized he was going to give me a raise in promotion. He wanted to make me his editor, <laughs> not go back to Reading Rainbow. He's going to work out a deal you know, with me. Because he saw, he saw that I was able to do the technical part, and I was good with the clients. Again, we see the idea of the communication part. Because most of the guys that were doing that were technical, but they, they weren't dealing with the client. He saw in me, and people were paying big bucks. I think they were paying like 500 bucks an hour to edit, and they were editing for weeks. So I said, boss, I'm going to stop you here. He says, Blatt, you don't stop someone when they're about to give you everything you wanted, which he was. I said, no, there's going to be something different. I want to go to learn for a while in a yeshiva. He said, you do, do you? <laughs> He, get, he opens the door. He said, you want to leave? Leave. I get up. He goes, sit down, Black. <laughs> is this going to cost me? And at that point, it was no longer employer-employee. Now it's man-to-man. And he said, I know what you're going through. He said, you go off to Israel. You do your thing. When you come back, I'll have a job waiting for you. And that's how we left it. So I went off to Asia Dara. Well, one, one second. One second. I, 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 I think that that's another gem that I would love to to – call the, the listener to, the viewer to, that you want to get man to man, man to woman, woman to woman, you know, whatever it might be, as fast as you possibly can. Because as long as we look at the, the people in our lives with their titles, we're always kind of relegated to that discussion of, you know, well, this is my boss, and so therefore I can't innovate, I can't speak to them. But as soon as you change that dynamic to, hey, we're two people, it's like, what can't be figured out in that regard? Very good, very good. And I remember he said to me, he said, I'm 35 at the time, my boss. He said, I just started dating Jewish women. So this was, so it, it, you're right. It went from that switch to boss of a big company right. yeah, to, uh, yeah, to me, to me, now Jew to Jew, man to man. It, interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful lesson. And it's, it's really about having the awareness. I, I, we could like stop the interview right there. That was, that was great. It's like having the, the awareness to be able to cut through to the person and not to, not to jump on a soapbox, but I'll do it anyway. It's like in a lot of ways for modern religion, I think that that's something that's getting lost in a little ways. It's like, this is the rabbi, this is the, the clergy person. It's like, I have to build myself up and sort of hide behind a certain level of, of, of whatever you want to call it, honor or, or create this distance. And the distance ultimately is, is, is detrimental to the relationship. When you could just say, Hey, hey I, I want to talk to you like a person, like the, 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 the rabbi can grow and the rabbi can really also have the ability to, to break through barriers with the other person. Just a thought. Anyway, go ahead. So you go to Asia Torah. So I go to Asia Torah. I'm there for three weeks. I'm loving it. And that turns into 23 years. Oh, well, let's, let's, <laughs> and, and so we caught up. 
Yeah. What, let's let's slow down a second. So let's slow down. So I'm I'm there for three. I'm all there for a short time. Okay. After, after about a year um, that I'm there, they asked me to be Rav Noach Weinberg, so it's our personal assistant. Remember, I'm 29 when I come. So I came. I was a little older, and uh, they hooked us up, and I became his assistant, and that was great. Be- what, what's it What's it like? being i mean it's funny now and i don't want to compare them but it's like you know you're hanging out with elton john and madonna and then you you meet you meet an a visionary from a different of a different world like what's what's he like like what what was the experience like and how did he kind of cultivate because you look a lot more like rav Noach would dress than elton john would dress like what is it about the relationship to him that made such an impression on you all right so you're it, doing this like reminds me of stories. I mean, we can, we're probably going to have a series. Great. When I, when I was in New York, I got to meet Rob Noach. I told you I was learning once a week. So, you know, the boss comes every once in a while. <laughs> Rob Noach pulls into New York and someone introduces, you know, you get to introduce your students. And he asked me, what are you doing? And I said, I'm playing rock and roll drums. I'm making television shows. Yeah. He looks me in the eye. You're going to love this. He says, how would you like to be really happy? Ha! That's what he asked me. I said, Rosh Hashiva, with all due respect, playing rock and roll drums and making television shows, we can get a line out the door going of people who would want to do this. This is happiness, I tell him. <laughs> he looks in my eyes, he pierces through me, and he says, really happy? He says, I want you to come to Israel. Spend some time over there, a couple of weeks. You check it out. You have nothing to lose. If you don't like what you see, if you don't get anything out of it, you just, you know, go back. Yeah. Just come, you know, check it out. Because if you're really happy and you're really connoisseur of happiness, you'll come check out what we have to offer. That's what he, that's what he said. You know, it's so funny. It's so funny because that's such a, what year was that? 91. I came, I came in 91, so I might have been cultivating in like 90. This it's, might have happened in 90. I'm just, I'm just, I'm thinking that it's funny. I, the, the, the world that we live in now is, A, on one hand, such a world of tremendous extremes. And on the other hand, it's a world where a person, I don't know, I don't know what it takes for you and I don't know what it would have taken for him to be able to say something like that. I don't know if that would still go over in the world today where you make this assumption like, it's like, it's a big person to hear that, I think, and say, okay, I'll check it out as opposed to what I would assume most people would say, which is like, hey, screw you, pal. Like, I'm already happy and, you know, maybe you should spend some time here. It was, but when you, and, and that's what it, that would be with most people. You know, that's not, it would have been like a joke that line. But when he looked, when he pierced my soul with that, he's like, really happy. Yeah. And I remember, or, or, or I'm not, I mean, he said, if you want to be a connoisseur of something, yeah. He, this is the example he used. I don't remember exactly when he used this. Yeah. Oh, I have another, another great story with Ram Noah before I can get there. He said, if you're on a beach, you love beaches. You're the expert in beaches. And you're sitting there. And someone comes over to you and says, you know, there's another beach not too far away. The sand is incredible. The waves, everything is just great about it come with me i'll take you there if you say, you know what i'm here already i'm in my bathing suit i'm uh, I'm, I'm here already i'm not going to, you're not a connoisseur because right. if you're a real connoisseur and you can apply this to anything right you don't get up and move right and i and i was i was enough in happiness not that i was i didn't wasn't thinking about how to be happy <laughs> you know right. i was just in it you know doing it uh, but uh, he made that that uh, that invitation and I think inside there was just something, I loved the learning, I had the time, going to Israel, and it was, it was all pre-birthright and everything. Um, I just, I, I went for it, I, I, I took it, and I went, and I loved it, and I, I got to Asia Tour and found guys like, like myself, you know, these were professional guys, we, there was accountants and investment bankers, you know, the, the people are, are over there, and I just I just fell in love with the, the learning and stayed. I never knew I was gonna, what was going to happen with it. I didn't have any any uh, plans, but uh, so just just come. Then when I be, I became his assistant, so now I'm um, I'm getting to be with the great wise man every day. I'm in his office. What was that like? 
incredible. I, mean, I should write a book. I mean, everyone's writing books now, you know, and right. after I, mean, like, I have, have, have my book. Incredible being a, around a great wise man like that to see how he acted, how, how he lived. I, I mean, I could tell you, I could tell you a, a, a stories. I was sitting up, I was, I was standing up there once. Here's a story. I'll show you his greatness once. I walk into his office and he looks a little forlorn, you know. I said, Rosh Hashiva, we had a good relationship. What, what's the what's matter? He says, I need $40,000 to pay my, uh, to pay the, some salaries. This, this guy, $40,000. He says, I don't know. I don't know. He says, I want you to go out of this office and I want you to find me $40,000. I said, from North, you know, Rebbe, where am I going to find? He says, don't ask me questions. I want you to go out of this office and find me for it. So I walk out of the office. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? I walk down to the base medrash. I'm, I'm standing there. What am I going to do this? There's a guy sitting outside the base medrash. Yeah, he's standing. He's there. He's there with the shtender. You know, he's learning. And I, uh, uh, I don't want to say the name of the person. <laughs> I walk over to him. He was a person who uh, represented uh, millions of dollars in the stock market there. And I walk over and I say, Rav Noach needs forty thousand dollars to pay. So the guy, he says, all right. I said, what do you mean, all right? <laughs> he says, all right. I'll tell him I'll get it for him. I walk upstairs. I go in and I say, Rav Noach. We got you 40000 He looks at his watch. He says, laser. That's what he used to call me affectionately. Laser. It's, it's 15 minutes. What took you so long? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> that was, to him, it was nothing. He's like, what? God can't bring me $40,000? That's what it was. I have, you ever, have you ever met someone besides him that really embodied that? Meaning it's like, it's, it's, it almost sounds like a, you know, one of the stories from the art school books that, uh, you know, but yeah, like, it's it not, he really lived it. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you. I remember someone saying, and you know, from your, from your work, if you meet one person who affects your life, who can mentor you or change you in some way, you're a lucky man. And I'm sure, you know, you're having your interviews, people say, you know, when I came to Asia Torah, in addition to Rav Noach, all of a sudden I had 15 of them. Because Rav Noach called, he brought in the best of the best. I mean, we had Rav Berkowitz and Rav Olawick and Rav Pliska. I mean, all, if, you, if you go to someone's art scroll library right. and you look at the books, yeah. I had them there. What right. was our class? We'd open up their book <laughs> you know, and start reading it. So I didn't have a chance. I'm now there with 15 you know, of the world's best with the unbelievable wisdom and I'm eating at the house for Shabbos, I'm meeting them. So I was able to, to absorb that. So mm -hmm. for me, yeah, that, that, that was my beginning. It changed over time. I mean, I, I was over there. I, you, you had Yom Tov Glazer, I know Rabbi Glazer on your, on your show. We were, we were in Yeshiva together. That was part of, wow. we, had, we had our team. Yeah. So you, mentioned, you mentioned that uh, in our in one of our pre uh, pre interview discussions, that you know everyone eventually has to go out, but you you never did and you never had to. What was that experience like? Staying staying back, like did, it's interesting for me because I think in the, in the corporate world and the professional world, people are always trying to figure out. Okay, you know I'm gonna like like you said, you know I, I'm gonna be more valuable when I know how to edit and then I'm even more valuable because I know how to handle the customers and I know how to edit. And so that's going to lead me to this opportunity. But then it's like you go to Yeshiva and it's just like, I'm hanging out with these, you know, the 15 wise men and I have no idea where this is going to go. So did you, were you aware that that shift had happened where you had kind of moved to a, a going into a being type of a state? And then how did you develop out of there? Did you ever kind of go back into, okay, what am I going to do with my life? Or it just literally was this organic process. So at that point, after being in Asian Torah for a while, the whole, the idea of Asian Torah is to build leadership and responsibility. So I knew at this point I was going to have to do something with my skills. We used to have a running joke when I used to walk into Rob Noah's office. He used to say, Hashem is looking. He says, what do I do with it? Rock and roll drummer. Yeah. Television producer. Yeah. Oh, Watch this, you know, he, where this was going to go. 
So at the point, at that point, most of the rabbis, they go out. And they I'm, just, I'm stopping you again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I just also want to point that out. It's funny. I literally, very recently, I, I had a guest on my, on my podcast that we, we spent about an hour discussing this topic. It's so funny. Nowadays, most people would say, let's get rid of the fact that you're a rock and roll drummer. Let's get rid of the fact that you, and pretend you never saw television before. Or if no, it's like, no, these are the, two, <laughs> these are the things you care about. Now let's try to figure out how you're going to serve the Jewish people. Exactly. Like, there's this like, you know, SO esoteric Jewish person that never watched TV and never, mm -hmm. and never played drums. Like, yeah, it, it's, an it's an amazing now, sign. Uh, no. Rab Noach and Isha Torah, the whole thing was take a person, here's their, what are their skills, what are their talents, and how those, there was a reason why I love that. I did it this way. Beautiful. You know, now we have to figure out what, what to do. And you, you can go with I mean, all the Isha Torah boys, that, you know, the ones that you know, well, all have with Moshe Zeldman, Yom Tov Glaze, all my students, by the way. You know? oh, nice. <laughs> That's uh, that was our. We were coming from a different place. I mean, that Moshe Zelman that he spoke to, you know, he, you know, computer, uh, you know, genius or, or Yonko, professional surfer and, and and singer. What do you, what do you do with it? It was the same same with me. That's what that's what you do. You cultivate those talents out. So I was going to be sent out, like all of the others, all, all my friends, you know, go out and become a, a Kira rabbi somewhere. But since I had the the drumming skills, I had a wedding band, mm -hmm. and. I started, I got to, we, we didn't even get to the public speaking part yet, how, how that came to be, but I had that at that, that point. So those two things, I was most of the reason why um, the rabbi, in addition to going out and being cure rabbis, is what are they going to do in Israel? Israel doesn't need, you know, a Balchuva rabbi. You know, there's plenty of real, <laughs> real ones, you know. <laughs> so, um, but I was able to stay, and uh, my wife was very, you know, happy about that, you know, for, making, you know, for a wife to be able to stay in Israel. Most of them, you know, they, they realize, you know, when they marry a Kira guy, you know, that, that's one of the questions they ask. If you're gonna, if you when you get to set up with a Kirov guy, that you're gonna, you know, how, you're gonna, how long are you living in the middle of nowhere? You know, you know from your background, you know where where are we going? You know, right, right, I got offers. Right, right. I got offers. You know, uh, I got an offer once. Eliezer, how would you like to be the wisest man of the city? <laughs> like ready <laughs> of the city of Russia? You know, be in the. <laughs> My wife said, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the type of thing. So I was able to stay. So I was able to stay at the yeshiva and do my thing and, and, and work. So, so, so talk to me about public speaking, talk to me about communication. I know that, and, and you're right. I think that this is going to be part one of, uh, of, of a few, but when did you realize or how crucial is it for people that are in the business that, that we're in, the business of, of communicating ideas, like how, how crucial is it to get a formal training or, or to learn how to communicate effectively? Well, I think let's just back up a little bit and make this bridge of where, how this developed. So while I was Rob Nowak's assistant, he was away a lot fundraising. So I had downtime, you know, he went, I wanted to go with him, but he didn't, you know, let me drive you around, do your appointments. He, when he went, he wanted to be on his own. So I was there and I had, you know, sometimes be for months. So we had a corporate public speaking fellow who came. He said, you guys are learning a lot of Torah, but you need help with your presentation skills. I said, great, you know, I'll help you. What was, what was my job? Taking the world's best talent, putting it on the screen. So working with some rabbinical students wasn't such a big stretch. So we worked together. I was his assistant. He did his, his speaker training and we took people through it. I watched him as I was doing other things. And after a year, he was leaving. He was going on his way. So Asia Torah says, we'll pay you to teach Eliezer everything you know about public speaking, which he, he was happy to do. And he trained me. And while I was doing that, I was reading the books and listening to the tapes. Yeah, we only had tapes at the time. <laughs> I've, I've heard of this. The seminars, to become the best expert I was able to become in this field. Now, it wasn't such a, a stretch. Again, what was my, I was being groomed to bring out the best of people. So the public speaking came in. And this fellow said to me, he said, he said, if you want to take this, you can go, you can really share things and bring people to big places. That's what he told me. I remember him saying it, but I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, I don't know where it's going to go, but I started teaching it after he left and in Asia Torah and they liked it. And then some of the Asia Torah branches found out and said, could you work with our rabbis and students and donors? And once I was in a city, the local hospital, which had Jewish surgeons, found out about me. There wasn't so many firm guys that were doing this. And the local kolels. And before I knew it, Yaakov, I was flying around the world doing public speaking training. It, it fell in my lap. 
all the coaching of the things I did with the music and the sports and my background and the coaching just fell and in, fell into place. And in this world, there was so many people in the film world that people aren't, aren't looking generally for speaker trainers. E even today it's, it's, you know, in the, in the, in the non uh, Jewish world, you know, it's, it's people know about it, but if, when people say, what you have, you get paid to help people speak. You know, it's like, I don't, uh, I don't understand. It's, it, it's so funny. I was literally just thinking that because I was, you know, just like it takes a certain level of greatness to not try to negate a person's past, but to embrace it and to, and to channel it. I think that also something that a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of people are challenged by is this idea that despite the fact that you have the truth of the Torah. And, and I, I feel like this is more and more kind of cultivating into my, my central message. I remember that the Gemara talks about how Shlomo Melch knew where all of the, King Solomon knew where all of the, uh, where buried treasures were buried in, in, the, uh, in the depths of the ocean because he knew the Torah so well. And so there's an idea that the Torah can teach us everything. But the reality is nowadays, that, that was Shlomo Melch. That was someone that knew the Torah really well to be able to extrapolate the information into the practical everyday life. But nowadays, most of us don't have that broadness of our, of our knowledge and we need these practical skills. And so it's such, you know what I'm saying? It's like such a, it's such a, a mind shift that makes so much sense why people in the Jewish world might say, well, like, you know, I, I am communicating the truth. Like, why do I need to be able to take a, you know, like speaker trainers are, are for, for Tony Robbins. It's like, no, man, like you need to communicate a message effectively. Same thing's true. It's like, you might know, I had someone else on, on my show that, you know, was, was trying to at, like, just focus on Shalom bias in the, you know, the, the black hat learning world. And he got so much pushback saying like, it's all in the Torah. And it's these like, that's great. But like, these guys can like dissect a Tosos, but they, but they, I don't, I'm, I'm not, it's, what I'm saying is controversial. I appreciate that. But this idea that there is a need to borrow or to reapply these explicit skill sets in the Jewish world. So what you're saying makes a ton of sense. It's like, dude, you, you need to know how to communicate effectively. Exactly. And that's why the major I do two things. One is work with the major organizations, a lot of the outreach ones, Asian Torah, Nerla Aleph, uh, YU. I get a phone call from YU. We heard that you're helping the, the rabbis yeah, with their public speaking skills. We have, we need, could you do a whole semester for us? So, be, wow. I so you know, YU, and then I travel around. All of the, the big uh, comp companies and organizations, why? Because they have to, they have to send people out, yeah? One of the skills that they're looking for, one of the biggest skills today, yeah, is to be able to communicate. Now, you would think, you know, today everything is computer, there'll be less of that. But because everyone's on their computer, people aren't communicating anymore. So all of the skill becomes so much more important. So I'm coming, and it's all levels, from a guy who wants to throw up, just thinking about public speaking, to Charlie Arari, Lori Palatnik, you know, good to great. When they came to... They were already good. They wanted to up their game. And a lot of people you Ellie had on your show, Yom Tov Glazer, Moshe Zelman, Yaakov Lehman. I mean, you see, you now, you're getting them from a different angle. They're not on your show. They're not saying, and, you know, I, I got communication. <laughs> you know, you say, what you? You need? Right. Because when they want to up their game, they know that that skill set is going to take them over the top. And that's where... Uh, I and I think it also breaks down to that human human connection at the end of the day is that a person you you can't look at this polished I mean it's it's a it's a stupid thing that we all do is it's like we look at a person's polished end product and we say well you know must be that that's how they are and I almost don't want to admit that I might need these technical skills because it's like, well, you know, they don't need it. And the reality is that why most people are at the places they are is because they just stepped up and said, I need help with these technical skills. Exactly. You know, TED Talks, people now, TED Talks right. is a big, raise the level, it's good for business. Most of the best TED Talks, the people that you see on those shows, right. they've been coached. TED Talk coached them. People like wonder, wow, she's not just the world's best neurologist. She's also a good public speaker. Yeah, no, they came with their content and who they were. And then, then they would, how do I know that? Because I'm on 
on online with some of the best trainers. Oh, I trained this one and I trained that one. So that's how I can see. They, ha they have a book that came out called Speak Like Ted. I think they yeah. broke down. Yeah, okay. They got official ones and unofficial ones. Nice. Now, so, yeah. so, so can you, okay, so here's, here's what I would love to do. We have to, this is going to be part A, um, but, but just to leave, if you could leave the viewers um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the listeners with three tips towards more effective communication, then really next time I'd love to delve in more to the nuances, et cetera. But like, what are three tips that a person could just take right now to make them a more effective communicator? Okay. So I think the, the first tip and the thing I spend a lot of time on with my students, with my clients, is what I call vitality, passion, the energy that you bring to the table. When you're coming, you're speaking about something and you're passionate and you're into it is the number one thing. Once I have that, I have clay to work with. Now, once knowing that, you can see how these names that I threw out of some of the students, they're all, they all are all passionate about them. In fact, some of them were so passionate and so powerful and strong, they were worried. If I go out in the world with this, is it too much for people to have? And, the, and that vitality and passion, as we know when we see them, that's what people love. That's why when a crowd of 2,000 people could come around an age conference, you know, uh, uh, a, uh, a Project Inspire, an Ol Olami thing, and you have a speaker who comes up with that energy, you need a lot of energy to spread for a few thousand people. How are you going to keep their attention? They got their phone in front of them. What, a person that's this big on a stage is going to take? So I need to come in and say, how do I get that little person on the stage with their wonderful content to be able to reach out so that person puts down the phone? Yeah. That's the, the whole thing. And listen to that person. But one of, one of my students once, they said to me, Elias, don't, don't feel bad. I'm not on the phone. I just want people. I, want, I got a friend. I want him to come in here and hear what you have to say. So then, <laughs> it's like, if, if you're using the technology for that, that's, that's great. But, uh, so I think, I think a, a key point, one of the, the key points is vitality, passion, energy. And I have exercises to build this. How do we bring that out of a person? Once you have that, then everything starts to fall into place because people will at least listen to you. That's, that's, uh, that's the first. Now, we, other things to go, I mean, we can, you know, do a part two. I mean, I have a whole semester. Leave, uh, leave it, leave it, leave it. I think vitality is very important. I think that, yeah. I, yeah. I, I think that, that the idea also, which is so crucial is, and, and forgive me if I'm, if I'm, kind of stepping on your toes here, I think that A, the vitality is something that you can, can be cultivated. So a lot of people are like, well, I'm not a charismatic person. The answer is like, well, maybe not, but we could get you a lot higher. And also this, this beautiful idea that you said, which is that, and it goes down to all of the, 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 um, the nonverbal being so much a part of our communication. It's like the passion sells, what you're selling is secondary. You know, and it's like, I have to become so technically skilled at something. People think, well, you know, I'm, I'm a big phony if I get up and I talk about something. And it's like, that's not really it. It's like, if you can communicate that passion, right, then the technical skills, they'll, they'll, they'll get in. But the passion is the first thing. That's amazing. Great. Yeah. There's also some, an, an important point that you brought up that I think is also key in this, is a lot of people have heard, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Yes. And the, and the speakers and speaker trainers will say that. I think one of the differences when I come is at the end of the day, your content is the most important thing. However, if you can't wrap it, what good is it? But I think a difference, and I, want to, I think this is important for, for your viewers to see and to hear, is to know at the end of the day, we're not make, it, it's authenticity. We throw that word around, you know, authenticity. What does that mean? It means at the end of the day, your content is the most important thing. And I have a whole thing on content development, how to bring that in. And I mix that with the presentation skills. Those two things together, the content and the presentation skills, that's what gets through. But people shouldn't feel, there's this famous study that was shown how the, the verbal part was, uh, was get the most attention and then the, the vocal part. And when you look at that study, people misconstrue it. <laughs> and it looks like content is, it looks like that the, how you say it is key. It's not. You want to get your content across, but you need to have be that vessel that it's going to happen. That's where I come in. But I want people to know that, not think, you know, oh, yeah, if I'm a good showman, 
Who cares what my content is? That, that's not, I don't think, the Jewish perspective. I think, I think that, um, you know, I, I spoke to someone yesterday that in the, in the real estate space. And so he was, he, he, so I said, you know, you know, real estate training nowadays is, is, is big business. And so I said, you know, okay, you know, it's cra- one of these crazy stories that he, he, he increased his net worth by 20,000% in the last two years, like super impressive. I said, so you're going to start teaching. And he said, it's really important to me that I actually do all of the stuff first before I start teaching. And then he gave some names of people that I I know. And he said, you know, really their portfolio is not that impressive, but because they have the platform, everyone thinks they're so much more successful than they are. And so that, that what you're saying is it sounds to be like exactly that message, which is, you know, yes, it's very important. And having a platform and being able to speak, it all increases. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a big, um, you know, force multiplier of your message, but the message still has to be good. You actually have to know and, and try to live that what you're, what you're, what you're selling. So it's, it's important. Great. Um, how do people find you now? I'm, I'm very excited. And then this will definitely be part one. Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Yeah. Eliezer Blatt. I mean, just go over and uh, it, it comes up. Uh, I have, yeah, people can email me, you know, eblatt6 at gmail.com. You know, sometimes people call me and say, like, I try to get in touch with you. Like, I'm, I'm, on, <laughs> I'm all over the place. It's not oh, hard. Google. You should try it. <laughs> yeah. So Amazing. I'm here. All right. Eliza, thank you so much for the help. I appreciate it. It was great talking to you today. Excellent. Same here. There you have it, folks, another inspiring episode. If you enjoyed this, I ask you to please share this with your friends and to like us over on Rabbi Rupp through Facebook or on YouTube. And the more that we're able to get these important messages out, the more that we can really make an impact in the world. So I encourage you, please, to stay tuned. Uh, We have a ton of amazing speakers coming up and also to tell your friends about it. Thank you very much.